Welcome back to VCRC Youth. Welcome to our series. We are in week four of our series called Five Hours. And tonight we are reading from the Gospel of John, again, chapter 13 still, um, as, as we seek uh, to, to learn from the last five hours that Jesus had with his disciples before his crucifixion. Uh, so tonight we're in 13, verses 31 through 38. Let's read that together. When he being Judas, had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By all this, people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. This passage opens by expressing that Judas has left. And we see that Jesus' language changes almost immediately. At first he was troubled, but now he speaks of being glorified. He says that it is time, he's saying that that the glorification process has begun. And Jesus being glorified as the Son of Man is is important specifically because it, it, it reminds us of two things. One, Jesus being the Son of Man reminds us of his humility. He stepped down from heaven into his own creation and became like us. He became human. But it also points us back to scriptures in the past. It points us to Daniel. Um, When Daniel has the vision of the throne room of God, he sees one that is like the Son of Man who is glorified, seated at the right hand of the Father with dominion over all of creation. But it also brings us all the way back to Genesis. And and this shows us God's perfect plan unfolding because in the beginning we saw the failure of of man. Man, Adam, was supposed to have dominion over all of all of the earth. He was supposed to cultivate the land, he was supposed to have dominion over the animals. We see Jesus here as as the true and the better Adam, as the Son of Man, who has come to reign over his creation as man was originally intended to, but has had failed in the past. And again, as as this posture changes, as we see Jesus turning uh, into into speaking of his his being made glorified, we see that he again is in utter control of all of this. It seems like a chaotic moment. We know that what's about to happen because we've read this before. We've we've heard these stories before. Um, but but his disciples haven't yet. And this is a reminder of his control as, as things begin to progress. What is really challenging, and, and we need to keep in mind that right now the disciples don't know the end of the story. The disciples are seeing this firsthand. And while we often um, poke fun at Peter specifically um, and all the disciples, we need to remember that they don't know the end of the story as we do. But what's challenging for them specifically, but also sometimes for us, is to know and see a Savior crucified. It didn't make sense for them that um, for Jesus to come and to save, to redeem his creation, that he must be brought so low, that he must be humiliated, that he must be killed. To this point, they were probably holding to what a lot of the Jews were at this point and understanding that a Savior would come and save them from Rome. Much like the judges, he would come and and take them out of control of their captors. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. 
for Jesus to be glorified, for him to ascend to his, his throne, he must first descend to his place on the cross. And this was something that Peter particularly found challenging, or at least he was the most vocal about it. He was the most recorded um, responding to. I don't think he was the only one that actually had trouble understanding this. Peter thought that he fully understood Jesus. He's just spent the last three years with him. He thought that he understood his teachings. Peter thought that he understood himself and that he had control over his own words and his actions. But we soon see that that is not true. Later, uh, we won't read it in this series, but later um, when, when Jesus is on trial, we'll see Peter deny Christ three times. And we do see that here. We see Jesus referring to that. Um, but Peter clearly had less control than he, than he really understood. He failed to grasp the concept of a crucified savior. He didn't want Jesus to step down. He didn't want a, a servant Lord. He didn't want him to wash his feet. He didn't want, later we'll see, he didn't want Jesus to, to be arrested as he attacks his, his arrest, arresters, I don't know, the guards. Those guys, you know, he cuts the guy's ear off, right? He, he, he can't see how these things play out, and it's because Peter is not in control. Christ is. But while we see this example, as we see Peter speak hastily often, as we see him rebuke Christ for washing him, or say, well, if, if you're going to wash me, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. Right, as we see him fail to understand, as we see him deny Christ three times, we see Jesus forgive and restore him just as many. For every time Peter fails, Christ says, I love you. Christ says, I forgive you. And Christ restores him each and every time. And while we study scripture and we see Jesus' example of a perfect life, we see him as the standard of, of God for humanity, uh, this unattainable standard that we cannot reach on our own. I, I think that God also gave us Peter. He gave us th this example of someone who fails and fails and messes up and speaks um, before thinking. Um, he acts without thinking. He thinks without acting. But every single time we see Christ forgiving him and we see Christ using him for his glory, we see him building a church upon him, and we see an example of someone who fails yet is used and loved by Christ. And we don't just see that with Peter. We also saw that with Paul the Apostle who, who was first a persecutor of the church, yet Christ redeemed him. Despite Paul's failures, Christ forgave him he loved him. He used him. And we saw that with the prophets of old. They would do amazing works. And then they would, they would have fears and they would have failures, but Christ would use them regardless. And we even saw it at the very beginning of, of humanity. The, the moment that Adam and Eve fell away from, from God, the moment sin entered the world, God's plan for redemption was put in motion. Our God has always been a God of second chances. And that is the God that we worship. And as we head into small groups tonight, that's what I want you to think about. That's what I want you to remember. I want you to remember who your God is. Remember how he humbled himself. Remember how he is glorified. Remember how he covers over and forgives every one of our shortcomings. So let's talk about that last five hours.